This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One: The Romantic Egotist. Chapter Three: The Egotist Considers. Part Three. The Devil. Healy's they left at twelve, and taxied to Bistolary's. There were Axia Marlowe and Phoebe Collum, from the Summer Garden Show, Fred Sloane and Amory. The evening was so very young that they felt ridiculous with surplus energy, and burst into the café like Dionysian revellers. "'Table for four in the middle of the floor!' yelled Phoebe. "'Hurry, old dear, tell him we're here!' "'Tell him to play admiration!' shouted Sloane. "'You two order!' Phoebe and I are going to shake a wicked calf. And they sailed off in the muddled crowd. Axia and Amory, acquaintances of an hour, jostled behind a waiter to a table at a point of vantage. There they took seats and watched. "'There's Findle Margeson, from New Haven,' she cried above the uproar. "'Lo, Findle! Woo-hee!' "'Oh, Axia!' he shouted in salutation. "'Come on over to our table!' "'No!' Amory whispered. "'Can't do it, Findle. I'm with somebody else. Call me up tomorrow about one o'clock.' Findle, a nondescript man about Bisties, answered incoherently and turned back to the brilliant blonde whom he was endeavouring to steer around the room. "'There's a natural damn fool,' commented Amory. "'Oh, he's all right. Here's the old jitney waiter. If you ask me, I want a double daiquiri.' "'Make it four. The crowd whirled and changed and shifted. They were mostly from the colleges, with a scattering of the male refuse of Broadway, and women of two types, the higher of which was the chorus girl. On the whole it was a typical crowd, and their party was as typical as any. About three-fourths of the whole business was for effect, and therefore harmless, ended at the door of the café, soon enough for the five o'clock train back to Yale or Princeton. About one-fourth continued on into the dimmer hours and gathered strange dust from strange places. Their party was scheduled to be one of the harmless kind. Fred Sloan and Phoebe Collum were old friends, Axia and Amory new ones. But strange things are prepared even in the dead of night, and the unusual, which lurks least in the café, home of the prosaic and inevitable, was preparing to spoil for him the waning romance of Broadway. The way it took was so inexpressibly terrible so unbelievable, that afterward he never thought of it as experience, but it was a scene from a misty tragedy, played far behind the veil, and that it meant something definite, he knew. About one o'clock they moved to Maxim's, and two found them in Deveniers. Sloane had been drinking consecutively, and was in a state of unsteady exhilaration, but Amory was quite tiresomely sober. They had run across none of those ancient, corrupt buyers of champagne who usually assisted their New York parties. They were just through dancing and were making their way back to their chairs when Amory became aware that someone at a nearby table was looking at him. He turned and glanced casually. A middle-aged man, dressed in a brown sack suit it was, sitting a little apart at a table by himself and watching their party intently. At Amory's glance he smiled faintly. Amory turned to Fred, who was just sitting down. "'Who's that pale fool watching us?' he complained indignantly. "'Where?' cried Sloane. "'We'll have him thrown out.' He rose to his feet and swayed back and forth, clinging to his chair. "'Where is he?' Axia and Phoebe suddenly leaned and whispered to each other across the table, and before Amory realized it, they found themselves on their way to the door. "'Where now?' "'Up to the flat.' suggested Phoebe. We've got brandy and fizz and everything's slow down here tonight. Amory considered quickly. He hadn't been drinking, and decided that if he took no more, it would be reasonably discreet for him to trot along in the party. In fact, it would be, perhaps, the thing to do in order to keep an eye on Sloane, who was not in a state to do his own thinking. So he took Axia's arm, and piling intimately into a taxicab, they drove out over the hundreds and drew up at a tall white stone apartment house. Never would he forget that street. 
It was a broad street lined on both sides with just such tall white stone buildings, dotted with dark windows. They stretched along as far as the eye could see, flooded with a bright moonlight that gave them a calcium pallor. He imagined each one to have an elevator, and a colored hall boy, and a key rack, each one to be eight stories high, and full of three and four room suites. He was rather glad to walk into the cheeriness of Phoebe's living room and sink onto a sofa, while the girls went rummaging for food. Phoebe's great stuff, confided Sloane sotto voce. I'm only going to stay half an hour, Amory said sternly. He wondered if it sounded priggish. Hell, you say, protested Sloane. We're here now, don't let's rush. I don't like this place, Amory said sulkily. And I don't want any food. Phoebe reappeared with sandwiches, brandy bottle, siphon, and four glasses. Amory, pour 'em out, she said, and we'll drink to Fred Sloan, who has a rare, distinguished edge. Yes, said Axia, coming in. And Amory, I like Amory. She sat down beside him and laid her yellow head on his shoulder. I'll pour, said Sloan. You use siphon, Phoebe. They filled the tray with glasses. Ready, here she goes. Amory hesitated, glass in hand. There was a minute while temptation crept over him like a warm wind, and his imagination turned to fire, and he took the glass from Phoebe's hand. That was all. For at the second that his decision came, he looked up and saw, ten yards from him, the man who had been in the cafe, and with his jump of astonishment the glass fell from his uplifted hand. There the man half sat, half leaned against a pile of pillows on the corner divan. His face was cast in the same yellow wax as in the cafe, neither the dull pasty color of a dead man, rather a sort of virile pallor, nor unhealthy, you'd have called it, but like a strong man who'd worked in a mine or done night shifts in a damp climate. Amory looked him over carefully, and later could have drawn him after a fashion, down to the merest details. His mouth was the kind that is called frank, and he had steady gray eyes that moved slowly from one to the other of their group, with just the shade of a questioning expression. Amory noticed his hands. They weren't fine at all, but they had versatility and a tenuous strength. They were nervous hands that sat lightly along the cushions, and moved constantly with little jerky openings and closings. Then suddenly Amory perceived the feet and with a rush of blood to the head he realized he was afraid. The feet were all wrong, with a sort of wrongness that he felt rather than knew. It was like a weakness in a good woman, or blood on satin, one of those terrible incongruities that shake little things in the back of the brain. He wore no shoes, but, instead, a sort of half-moccasin pointed through like the shoes they wore in the fourteenth century and with the little ends curling up. They were a darkish brown, and his toes seemed to fill them to the end. They were unutterably terrible. He must have said something, or looked something, for Axia's voice came out of the void with a strange goodness. Well, look at Amory. Poor old Amory is sick. Old head going round? Look at that man, cried Amory, pointing toward the corner divan. You mean that purple zebra? shrieked Axia facetiously. Ooh-ee! Amory's got a purple zebra watching him. Sloane laughed vacantly. Old zebra gotcha, Amory? There was a silence. The man regarded Amory quizzically. Then the human voices fell faintly on his ear. Thought you weren't drinking, remarked Axia sardonically, but her voice was good to hear. The whole divan that held the man was alive alive like heat-waves over asphalt, like wriggling worms. "'Come back! Come back!' Axia's arm fell on his. "'Amory, dear! You aren't going, Amory!' He was halfway to the door. "'Come on, Amory, stick with us.' "'Sick, are you? Sit down a second. Take some water. Take a little brandy.' The elevator was close, and the colored boy was half asleep paled to a livid bronze. Axia's beseeching voice floated down the shaft. Those feet! Those feet! As they settled to the lower floor,
the feet came into view in the sickly electric light of the paved hall. In the alley. Down the long street came the moon, and Amory turned his back on it and walked. Ten, fifteen steps away sounded the footsteps. They were like a slow dripping, with just the slightest insistence in their fall. Amory's shadow lay perhaps ten feet ahead of him, and Soft Shoes was presumably that far behind. With the instinct of a child, Amory edged in under the blue darkness of the white buildings, cleaving the moonlight for haggard seconds, once bursting into a slow run with clumsy stumblings. After that he stopped suddenly. He must keep hold, he thought. His lips were dry, and he licked them. If he met any one good— Were there any good people left in the world, or did they all live in white apartment houses now? Was everyone followed in the moonlight? But if he met someone good who'd know what he meant, and hear this damned scuffle— Then the scuffling grew suddenly nearer, and a black cloud settled over the moon. When again the pale sheen skimmed the cornices, it was almost beside him, and Amory thought he heard a quiet breathing. Suddenly he realized that the footsteps were not behind, had never been behind. They were ahead, and he was not eluding, but following, following. He began to run, blindly, his heart knocking heavily, his hands clinched. Far ahead a black dot showed itself, resolved slowly into a human shape. But Amory was beyond that now. He turned off the street and darted into an alley, narrow and dark and smelling of old rottenness. He twisted down a long, sinuous blackness, where the moonlight was shut away except for tiny glints and patches, then suddenly sank panting into a corner by a fence, exhausted. The steps ahead stopped, and he could hear them shift slightly with a continuous motion, like waves around a dock. He put his face in his hands, and covered eyes and ears as well as he could. During all this time it never occurred to him that he was delirious or drunk. He had a sense of reality such as material things could never give him. His intellectual content seemed to submit passively to it, and it fitted like a glove everything that had ever preceded it in his life. It did not muddle him. It was like a problem whose answer he knew on paper, yet whose solution he was unable to grasp. He was far beyond horror. He had sunk through the thin surface of that, now moved in a region where the feet and the fear of white walls were real, living things, things he must accept. Only, far inside his soul, a little fire leaped and cried that something was pulling him down, trying to get him inside a door and slam it behind him. After that door was slammed there would be only footfalls and white buildings in the moonlight, and perhaps he would be one of the footfalls. During the five or ten minutes he waited in the shadow of the fence, there was somehow this fire. That was as near as he could name it afterwards. He remembered calling aloud. I want someone stupid. Oh, send someone stupid. This to the black fence opposite him, in whose shadows the footsteps shuffled, shuffled. He supposed stupid and good had become somehow intermingled through previous association. When he called thus, it was not an act of will at all. Will had turned him away from the moving figure in the street. It was almost instinct that called, just the pile on pile of inherent tradition, or some wild prayer from way over the night. Then something clanged like a low gong struck at a distance, and before his eyes a face flashed over the two feet, a face pale and distorted, with a sort of infinite evil that twisted it like flame in the wind. But he knew— for the half-instant that the gong tanged and hummed, that it was the face of Dick Humbird. Minutes later he sprang to his feet, realizing dimly that there was no more sound, and that he was alone in the graying alley. It was cold, and he started on a steady run for the light that showed the street at the other end. At the Window It was late morning when he awoke, and found the telephone beside his bed in the hotel tolling frantically, and remembered that he had left word to be called at eleven. Sloane was snoring heavily, his clothes in a pile by his bed. They dressed, and ate breakfast in silence, and then sauntered out to get some air. 
Amory's mind was working slowly, trying to assimilate what had happened, and separate from the chaotic imagery that stacked his memory, the bare shreds of truth. If the morning had been cold and gray, he could have grasped the reins of the past in an instant. But it was one of those days that New York gets sometimes in May, when the air on Fifth Avenue is a soft, light wine. How much or how little Sloane remembered, Amory did not care to know. He apparently had none of the nervous tension that was gripping Amory, and forcing his mind back and forth like a shrieking saw. Then Broadway broke upon them, and with the babble of noise and the painted faces a sudden sickness rushed over Amory. "'For God's sake, let's go back. Let's get off this—this this place!' Sloane looked at him in amazement. "'What do you mean?' "'This street! It's ghastly! Come on, let's get back to the avenue.' "'Do you mean to say,' said Sloane stolidly, "'that cause you had some sort of indigestion that made you act like a maniac last night, "'you're never coming on Broadway again?' "'Simultaneously Amory clasped him with the crowd. "'He seemed no longer Sloane of the debonair humour and the happy personality, "'but only one of the evil faces that whirled along the turbid stream. "'Man!' he shouted so loud that the people on the corner turned and followed them with their eyes. "'It's filthy, and if you can't see it, you're filthy, too.' "'I can't help it,' said Sloane doggedly. "'What's the matter with you? Old remorse getting you? You'd be in a fine state if you'd gone through with our little party.' "'I'm going, Fred,' said Amory slowly. His knees were shaking under him, and he knew that if he stayed another minute on this street he would keel over where he stood. "'I'll be at the Vanderbilt for lunch.' and he strode rapidly off and turned over to Fifth Avenue. Back at the hotel he felt better, but as he walked into the barber shop, intending to get a head massage, the smell of the powders and tonics brought back Axia's sidelong, suggestive smile, and he left hurriedly. In the doorway of his room a sudden blackness flowed around him like a divided river. When he came to himself he knew that several hours had passed. He pitched onto the bed and rolled over on his face with a deadly fear that he was going mad. He wanted people, people, someone sane and stupid and good. He lay for he knew not how long without moving. He could feel the little hot veins on his forehead standing out, and his terror had hardened on him like plaster. He felt he was passing up again through the thin crust of horror, and now only could he distinguish the shadowy twilight he was leaving. He must have fallen asleep again, for when he next recollected himself, he had paid the hotel bill and was stepping into a taxi at the door. It was raining torrents. On the train for Princeton he saw no one he knew, only a crowd of fagged-looking Philadelphians. The presence of a painted woman across the aisle filled him with a fresh burst of sickness, and he changed to another car, tried to concentrate on an article in a popular magazine. He found himself reading the same paragraphs over and over, so he abandoned this attempt and, leaning over wearily, pressed his hot forehead against the damp windowpane. The car, a smoker, was hot and stuffy with most of the smells of the state's alien population. He opened a window and shivered against the cloud of fog that drifted in over him. The two hours' ride were like days, and he nearly cried aloud with joy when the towers of Princeton loomed up beside him and the yellow squares of light filtered through the blue rain. Tom was standing in the centre of the room, pensively relighting a cigar stub. Amory fancied he looked rather relieved on seeing him. "'Had a hell of a dream about you last night,' came in the cracked voice through the cigar smoke. "'I had an idea you were in some trouble.' "'Don't tell me about it,' Amory almost shrieked. "'Don't say a word. I'm tired and pepped out.' Tom looked at him queerly, and then sank into a chair and opened his Italian notebook. Amory threw his coat and hat on the floor, loosened his collar, and took a Wells novel at random from the shelf. "'Wells is sane,' he thought, "'and if he won't do, I'll read Rupert Brooke.' Half an hour passed. Outside the wind came up, and Amory started as the wet branches moved and clawed with their finger-like nails at the window-pane. Tom was deep in his work and inside the room only the occasional scratch of a match, or the rustle of leather as they shifted in their chairs, broke the stillness. Then, 
Like a zigzag of lightning came the change. Amory sat bolt upright, frozen cold in his chair. Tom was looking at him with his mouth drooping, eyes fixed. "'God help us!' Amory cried. "'Oh, my heavens!' shouted Tom. "'Look behind!' Quick as a flash, Amory whirled around. He saw nothing but dark window-pane. "'It's gone now,' came Tom's voice after a second in a still terror. "'Something was looking at you.' Trembling violently, Amory dropped into his chair again. "'I've got to tell you,' he said. "'I've had one hell of an experience. "'I think I've—I've I've seen the devil, or something like him. "'What face did you just see? "'Or no,' he added quickly, "'don't tell me.' "'And he gave Tom the story. "'It was midnight when he finished, "'and after that, with all lights burning, two sleepy, shivering boys read to each other from the new Machiavelli— until dawn came up out of Witherspoon Hall, and the Princetonian fell against the door, and the May birds hailed the sun on last night's rainfall. End of Book One, Chapter Three, Part Three